The reading from Romans that you are about to hear is the reading from the Revised Common Lectionary for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, Year A. For those who aren't familiar with the Revised Common Lectionary, it's a three-year cycle of recommended scripture readings that is used by all Catholics and many Protestant churches. It covers most of the Bible over a three-year cycle with readings from the Hebrew scriptures and the gospels and the epistles. This reading is not actually the prescribed reading for today from the lectionary, but when Nan and I found this book by Rachel Held Evans, published after her death, called What God is Like, I remembered a sermon that I originally preached in 2005 as my senior sermon in seminary. Say that five times really fast. One of the joys of being a lectionary preacher is that you get to be challenged from time to time with a text that you might not choose yourself with uh, some sort of scripture reading that you would normally just pass by. One of the challenges and joys of being a lectionary preacher is that some texts are not in the lectionary. But in seminary, they teach us three little words that help with that dilemma. Three little words that can help even the most disciplined and dedicated lectionary preacher. Extend the pericope. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? It's a $2 term for adding some verses to one end or the other of the scripture reading. Unfortunately, uh, Microsoft Word spell checker didn't go to seminary. So every time a preacher tries to write these three magical words, extend the pericope, spell checker helps us by correcting it to extend the periscope. Isn't that a great term? It makes me feel like an officer on the sea view or on, you know, voyage to the bottom of the sea. For those who aren't old enough to remember that show, it was a television show in the 1960s. For those of you who are old enough to remember, stop thinking about Admiral Nelson and the flying sub, but be ready because in a little while, we're going to extend the pericope or the periscope as the word spell check might say it. We're going to extend this pericope by a few verses. Paul has been writing this letter to the Christians in Rome, where there's an ongoing dispute between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The dispute is about what it means to be a believer, a follower of the way. There's an argument among them about God's intentions and what God's justice means. In Romans, Paul has spent most of chapters one through eight addressing this question of who's in and who's out. But he hasn't spent his best currency um, because in chapters 9 through 11, he unpacks the answers to the questions he's been asking. And one of the central questions in Romans is, what is God like? Well, what is God's light? What is God like? Let's hear God's word to us in Romans 11, verses 1 through 2 and 29 through 32. I ask then... Has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable? Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. What is God like? The scriptures are full of images, many of which 
you've encountered today in our liturgy and the images from Rachel Held Evans' book. On this rally day, when we reconvene our programs of Christian education and this very special day when we will baptize Karsten, we focus on how we describe what God is like. You know, I was in children's ministry for many years, and in children's ministry, I learned that children have a deep sense of certainty about what they know of God. They are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you in a debate about what God is like. On the second Sunday of October in 2001, the lectionary Bible story was about the persistent widow, that story that Jesus told of the widow knocking, knocking, knocking on the judge's door, seeking justice. It happened that one week earlier, just a month past the September 11 attacks, the United States began airstrikes and dropping food on um, Afghanistan. Yes, they were dropping bombs and food supplies. President George W. Bush announced, now the Taliban will pay a price. By destroying camps and disrupting communications, we'll make it more difficult for the terror network to train new recruits and coordinate their evil plans. At the same time, he said, the oppressed people of Afghanistan will know the generosity of America and our allies. As we strike military targets, we will also drop food, medicine, and supplies to the starving and suffering men and women and children of Afghanistan. So anyway, I read to the children the story Jesus told, the parable of the persistent widow knocking on the door, seeking justice, and I asked, what is God's justice? Miles said she thought it must be about making everything fair and equal. But Sean said that God was making justice by letting America bomb Afghanistan. Isabel said, that's not God's justice. You can't make justice by dropping bombs and green beans on people. What is God's justice, I asked her. She said, God makes things right. God fixes things so that everything works. It isn't like one person wins and the other person loses. God wins. Isabel didn't know it, but she was echoing the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, God's justice is love, correcting that which would work against love. That's what God is like. The Apostle Paul knew what God is like. He knew maybe better than anyone that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul logics out what God is like in relation to us, Jews and Gentiles alike. Paul thinks this through in detail, sin and obedience, disobedience and redemption, justification by faith, righteousness, grace and the law, God's justice, God's mercy, God's extravagant and eternal love. In Romans, we find scriptures describing God. Chapter 5, verse 8, God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what God is like. Just before the verses in today's scripture reading, Paul has recounted the history of God's presence in creation, showing how God is sovereign over all creation, how God is working God's purpose out among the Jews and the Gentiles. And now in chapter 11, we get Paul's closing argument. God keeps all God's covenants. God's gifts are irrevocable. God is merciful to all. That's what God is like. In spite of our weakness, 
God's love is strong. In spite of our unfaithfulness and disobedience, God is always faithful. In the face of our thoughtlessness, God is merciful. That's what God is like. Years ago, my friends, Victoria and Frank, lost their son, Brent. Brent was only 32 when he died unexpectedly, aspirating during an asthma attack while his partner, Jimmy, was out walking their dog. Victoria and Frank were shattered. The church, and particularly the group that called ourselves the Yaya Sisters, a tight-knit group of friends of Victoria's, we all gathered around to help. Everyone pitched in with child care and airline points for flights and with love and with prayer. I sat with Victoria as she prepared for the journey to collect Brent's things and to join his friends in Seattle in a memorial service. We talked about the trip ahead of them, what it would be like when they arrived. Then Victoria turned to me with a worried expression and she says one more thing. Frank doesn't know that Brent was gay. We decided we would have to, that she would have to tell him before they got to Seattle. So we worked out how she could broach the subject. We rehearsed it. So on the plane to Seattle, Victoria said to Frank, I wish Brent had had children so we would have some part of him that we could hold on to. Frank said, Brent was never going to give us grandchildren. What do you mean? Victoria asked. Brent was gay, Frank said gently. Victoria said, how did you know? Frank said, he told me when I was in the hospital and he came to see me. He, he told me, didn't, didn't he tell you? Didn't you know? When they arrived in Seattle, they went to Brent's apartment and Brent's partner, Jimmy, met them there at the door looking small and broken. Victoria said his thin wrist stuck out of the sleeves of the sport coat he'd could on, put on so that he looked kind of like a scarecrow but he had dressed up to meet his partner's parents. Jimmy opened the door and Frank, the big macho former Marine, walked straight to Jimmy and enfolded him in his arms and leaned over to him and said, thank you for loving my son. That's what God is like. And when we held Brent's funeral and he came home at last to the church where we baptized him, where some people told him that he wasn't welcome because he was gay, but others said that God loved him and knew him and claimed him before he was even born. When Brent came home, we wept and we prayed and we gathered. And at the end of it all, what could we do but sing? What could we do but sing? And that's what happens with the Apostle Paul and with us if we are paying attention. We think we know what God is like and then we hear the water poured into the baptismal font before the assurance of pardon. We see the communion table spread for us and the host inviting everyone and we know we are about to find out what it means to be welcomed. We think we know what God is like, and then we see enemies reconciled, families reunited, tears dried, wounds healed, and we are too amazed to speak. We think we know what God is like, and then we hear a parent saying, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We love you. Come home. We think we know what God is like. And then we hear a father saying, thank you 
for loving my son. We think we know what God is like, and then we encounter over and over again the prodigal, extravagant, unfathomable grace and mercy and love that are God's kind of justice. This moment of encounter, this stunning, overwhelming moment, stops us in our tracks, silencing all our apologetics, all our legal and theological arguments, all our disputations over polity. And in this moment, in this epiphany, we extend the periscope. And what do we see? We see what Paul sees. In Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, listen for God's word to us. We see the vast unsearchable riches and wisdom and knowledge of God spread out before us in an ocean of grace, rising above us like magnificent mountains, piercing our hearts with the exquisite beauty and wonder of our faith, surrounding us like a grandmother's embrace, enfolding us like a father's hug, and what is left to do but sing. So we sing with Paul in Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are God's judgment and how unscrutable God's ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been God's counselor? Who has given a gift to God to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's what God is like. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.